In an epic August 9th Midnight's Edge livestream, Gary from Nerdrotic received an exciting message from one of his Star Wars insiders. One thing I'm learning is buying all the rights to something is not buying all the rights. And this is from watching Mid Midnight's Edge and Robert Meyer Burnett. You can own all the rights to something and still can't use everything in it. Because yeah, of, it's incredible. Uh, IP, you know, that, um, the intellectual yeah, properties. Anybody, and the, yeah. yeah, anybody read Hitchhiker and remember the spaceship that was run on Bistro Mathematics because nobody could ever figure them out. They were quantum. They, they. I mean, that's that intellectual property is the same thing. It's so quantum it could generate like a, a, a star. It's like, right. it makes no freaking sense at all. And uh, yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll be doing a video. I just got some news, some crazy Star Wars news that is very similar to what's oh, going no. on in Star Trek. Well, yeah, luckily you know, for, oh, let's luckily hear for Stargate, uh, I can't say anything right now, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll message mm -hmm. you. I just, I, I mean, it like it's been pinging to me right now. So the morning after both he and Doomcock shared this intel with the rest of the world that Disney may have deliberately sidelined the original trilogy characters because George Lucas still owns a stake in them and therefore must be cut in on their usage. While Lucas may retain the rights to the original characters, Disney owns the newly created characters wholesale meaning they have a financial incentive to discard the original characters as quickly as possible and push their own to the forefront. We can't really take what these companies say at face value, and unless they provide actual documented evidence, this is something that will be speculated on a lot because it's very similar to what's going on with Star Trek and Star Trek Discovery and Secret Hideout and the possible connections to Bad Robot and that 25% difference due to licensing. If you're a Star Wars fan, you're not going to know what I'm talking about, so I'll link the Midnight's Edge video in the description. Even if you are a diehard Star Wars fan and could not care less about Star Trek, we would advise you to become familiar with the Star Trek right situation, as it may be the key to understanding the motivations behind what Lucasfilm, Disney, and J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot are doing with Star Wars. That is what this video is for. First, we will recap the Star Trek right situation for Star Wars fans who may be unfamiliar with it before sharing what we have heard of the Star Wars situation and how the two differ from one another. The Star Trek right situation is complex. In fact, there is nothing quite like it in Hollywood history. To fully grasp it and its implications, you need to clear an hour of your schedule, sit down, and watch the video linked here. For this video, we are going through the Cliff Notes version as it follows. Following the 2005 corporate split of the Viacom Corporation, Paramount, Star Trek's traditional custodian were robbed of Star Trek. The property was, with this split, taken from Paramount and given to CBS. The thing was that CBS never asked for Star Trek. CBS never had anything to do with Star Trek before, and to those at the network that mattered, no one really got Star Trek. Despite suddenly being gifted the Star Trek rights, the powers that be at CBS had no intention of actually doing anything with them. That is, outside of passively collecting the merchandising revenue from third-party licensees. Star Trek merchandise still brought in tens of millions of dollars per year without CBS having to do anything for it beyond cashing checks. It was that aspect of Star Trek that they understood and liked. Paramount, however, didn't like this state of affairs at all. The Star Trek merchandising revenue CBS now got to collect used to belong to Paramount. Furthermore, Star Trek used to be a reliable performer for them both on film and on television. In the Viacom split, they had lost their ability to make either. This all occurred at a bad time for Paramount as they were in desperate need of franchises, ideally those with a built-in audience and merchandising revenue to match. In other words, a franchise like Star Trek. The problem was that CBS now owned Star Trek. Even if CBS had no plans to make any Star Trek at this juncture, they had every intention to continue to collect the revenue generated from licensed Star Trek merchandise. CBS were indifferent to Paramount's problems, but wherever there is a will, there is a way. And so, they were able to find a solution that gave both parties what they wanted. The solution amounted to CBS issuing Paramount an alternate Star Trek license, one which would allow Paramount not only to make a new Star Trek franchise on film, but which also allowed them to get the merchandise revenue flowing again. That gave Paramount what they wanted. CBS also got what they wanted, as Paramount essentially became another licensee that CBS could cash checks from. Only the check from Paramount now was much bigger than from anyone else. At this point, the question you should be asking is, so CBS collects merchandising revenue from third-party licensees and Paramount collects merchandising revenue from third-party licensees. Is that the same revenue? 
How does that work and what does any of this have to do with Star Wars? This is now the heart of the matter and the link to Star Wars is about to become clear. CBS kept the rights to all the original Star Trek series and the likenesses of all characters and ships in them. The revenue from licensed Star Trek merchandise based on anything from these original series goes to CBS. What CBS issued Paramount was a license to create an alternate Star Trek. One which in order to be monetized for third-party merchandise had to visually and tonally differ from CBS's original Star Trek. Exactly how quote-unquote different is disputed. The frequently cited figure is a difference of 25%. What this means in practical terms is that revenue from merchandise featuring, for example, a Captain Kirk toy made in the likeness of William Shatner, wearing the straight shirt and the cloth insignia goes to CBS. By contrast, revenue made from the merchandise featuring Captain Kirk made in the likeness of Chris Pine, wearing a slightly different colored shirt that is watermarked with raised deltas and a metal insignia, goes to Paramount. Paramount can separately license pretty much anything from the original Star Trek for screen use. However, they cannot monetize it. Case in point, Star Trek Into Darkness. All toys based on the likenesses of the alternate versions of Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Khan, the Enterprise, and all of that went to Paramount. However, the Tribble was the exact same Tribble that appeared in the original series. So the merchandising revenue from the plush Tribble toys went to CBS. So if Paramount wanted to make a continuation of the original Star Trek in tone and likeness of the original Star Trek series, they could have done it. However, if they did, the merchandising revenue would go to CBS. As such, it was in Paramount's best interest to feature as little of the original Star Trek on screen as possible, as they would not be able to monetize it. Instead, they would push forward with a new Star Trek that would be theirs to monetize. That is what the 2009 reboot was all about. To make the movie, Paramount hired J.J. Abrams and his production company Bad Robot, who would also receive a cut of Paramount's licensing revenue from third-party merchandise. This revenue, however, came in below expectations. Because courtesy of CBS, there was still competing Star Trek merchandise based on the original iteration of Star Trek in stores. J.J. Abrams then approached CBS and asked them to cancel all merchandise based on the original Star Trek, which is another way of saying he asked them to give up potentially $30 million of free money. CBS's response to this request was reportedly that they invited Abrams to leave the premises and essentially urged him to self-copulate. Bear in mind, CBS could not care less about Paramount and their problems. It was frustration over this that caused J.J. Abrams to ditch Star Trek and take on Star Wars instead, again under the Bad Robot banner. The recent rumor that both Nerd Roddick and Doomcock are reporting on is that despite Disney having bought Lucasfilm and Star Wars with it, George Lucas himself retains a share of all the original characters that he created. Disney can use them on screen but Lucas is entitled to a cut of the merchandise, a cut in the vicinity of 20-25% to according to their source. Both Gary Beekler of Nerd Roddick and Doomcock did however stress that this cannot be independently verified and must be taken with a grain of salt. So have we at Midnight's Edge heard anything about this? We cannot comment on just exactly how big a cut Lucas gets. Nor can we verify this by citing other published sources, so we do treat it as a rumor. However, we have also heard from one of our sources that Lucas does indeed get a cut of the merchandise based on the original characters that he created. We have also heard that there is a loophole. If Disney somehow customizes these original characters, making them different from the originals that Lucas created, then they don't have to pay him or at the very least, they have to pay him less. How big a difference does it have to be? Again, we cannot verify this but as an estimate with some precedence, let's say 25% different. Midnight's Edge has touched on this subject before. On February 18th, Midnight's Edge discussed the Star Trek rights situation with Robert Meyer Burnett. We must stress that in this instance we were discussing Star Trek, not Star Wars and that this was recorded six months before these reports by Nerdrotic and Doomcock. Burnett is neither confirming, denying, or in any other way commenting on these specific rumors. For full context, watch the entire video. However, the example he did use to illustrate Bad Robot and their interest in merchandise is nonetheless relevant to the topic at hand. Bad Robot was not just going to go back and recreate something without a stake in it. They had to make it worth their while. Now, I was not privy to 
I have not heard, I have not talked to a lawyer necessarily about what was done officially. But to me, it just, it goes without saying that if you're involved in an entertainment concern and you're bad robot and you're gonna reinvent Star Trek, you're gonna wanna make it your own. That's why, for instance, you saw the J.J. Abrams did the same thing with Star Wars. C-3PO has a red arm. The Millennium Falcon has a rectangular dish. Let's, let's not use R2-D2, let's put a tarp over him and let's create BB-8, something that we own. Because they have a fat slice of the merchandising rights off the new characters that they created for the series. I mean, they're not gonna, they're smart. This gives Disney an incentive to push the original characters created by them, which they get 100% of the merchandising revenue from, to the forefront while sidelining the original characters. It has, however, not worked out. There are numerous reports of Star Wars toys on store shelves collecting dust because audiences just haven't taken to these new characters in the same way they did the old. Another rumor we've heard is that the situation is even worse than the media indicates, as there allegedly exists in an undisclosed location an entire warehouse full of unsold Star Wars toys, one that Disney hopes will be struck by lightning or some other disaster so they can claim the insurance on it. Failing that, Disney, pending the right situation, can donate these toys to some appropriate charity for a tax write-off. So does this absolve anyone for the direction of Star Wars under Disney? In the case of Star Trek, however temporary it may be, we are still dealing with two different corporations. If Paramount were to make Star Trek movies with the tone and visuals of the original series, they would wipe out their own ability to make any money from merchandise on it, as that would default to CBS. The board would not respond kindly to that as such. One might not agree with their creative decisions, but one can see where they are coming from. With Star Wars, however, there are no competing corporations or alternate licenses to deal with, only George Lucas. The rumors circulating say that Disney will still profit from the merchandise based on the original Star Wars. However, the profit margin is just lower on that than on their proprietary characters, as they have to give Lucas a piece of the action. Again, we must stress that all of this must be treated as rumor. However, imagine for a moment that this is accurate. If so, do you think this is a good excuse to sideline the original characters? And do you think any of this might have influenced the creative decisions Disney and Lucasfilm's Star Wars ended up taking? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a comment, like it, and help share it. Or if you didn't, tell us why in the comments. If you did enjoy it, then feel free to subscribe, but remember to hit the bell icon to select that you want notifications all the time, otherwise YouTube might randomly unsubscribe you. Midnight's Edge is completely independent and devoted to bringing you the intelligent analysis of the inner workings of the film industry and genre media. If you like what we do, then we would be very grateful if you could help us keep the lights on by supporting us on Patreon or on Subscribestar. Our backers receive exclusive rewards and bonuses. Before you go, check out these other videos that may interest you, and our sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark for more live shows and more laid-back content.